Sea of Cortez, Chapter 1. How does one organize an expedition? What equipment is taken? What source is read? What are the little dangers in the large ones? No one has ever written this. The information is not available. The design is simple, as simple as the design of a well-written book. Your expedition will be enclosed in the physical framework of start, direction, ports of call, and return. These you can forecast with some accuracy, and in the better known parts of the world, it is possible to a degree to know what the weather will be in a given season, how high and low the tides, and the hours of their occurrence. One can know within reason what kind of boat to take, how much food will be necessary for a given crew for a given time, what medicines are usually needed, all this subject to accident, of course. We had read what books were available about the Gulf, and they were few and in many cases confused. The coast pilot had not been adequately corrected for some years. A few naturalists with specialties had gone into the Gulf and, in the way of specialists, had seen nothing they hadn't wanted to. Clavigero, a Jesuit of the 18th century, had seen more than most and reported what he saw with more accuracy than most. There were some romantic accounts by young people who had gone to the Gulf looking for adventure and, of course, had found it. The same romantic drive aimed at the stockyards would not be disappointed. From the information available, a few facts did emerge. The Sea of Cortez, or the Gulf of California, is a long, narrow, highly dangerous body of water. It is subject to sudden and vicious storms of great intensity. The months of March and April are usually quite calm and dependable, and the March-April tides of 1940 were particularly good for collecting in the littoral. The maps of the region were self-possessed and confident about headlands, coastlines, and depth, but at the edge of the coast they became apologetic laid-in lagoons with dotted lines, supposed and presumed their boundaries. The coast pilot spoke as heatedly as it ever does about mirage and treachery of light. Going back from the coast pilot to Clavigero, we found more visual warnings in his accounts of ships broken up and scattered, of wrecks and wayward currents, of fifty miles of sea more dreaded than any other. The coast pilot, like an elderly scientist, cautious and restrained, on the one side, and the old monk, setting down ships and men lost, and starvation on the inhospitable coasts. In time of peace in the modern world, if one is thoughtful and careful, it is rather more difficult to be killed or maimed in the outland places of the globe than it is in the streets of our great cities. But the atavistic urge towards danger persists, and its satisfaction is called adventure. However, your adventurer feels no gratification in crossing Market Street in San Francisco against the traffic. Instead, he will go to a good deal of trouble and expense to get himself killed in the South Seas. In reputedly rough water, he will go in a canoe. He will invade deserts without adequate food, and he will expose his tolerant and uninoculated blood to strange viruses. This is adventure. It is possible that his ancestor, wearying of the humdrum attacks of the saber tooth, longed for the good old days of pterodactyl and triceratops. We had no urge toward adventure. We plan to collect marine animals in a remote place on certain days and at certain hours indicated on the tide charts. To do this, we had, in so far as we were able, to avoid adventure. Our plans, supplies, and equipment had to be more, not less, than adequate. And none of us was possessed of the curious boredom within ourselves, which makes adventurers or bridge players. Our first problem was to charter a boat. It had to be sturdy and big enough to go to sea, comfortable enough to live on for six weeks, roomy enough to work on, and shallow enough so that little bays could be entered. The purse saners of Monterey were ideal for the purpose. They are dependable workboats with comfortable quarters and ample storage room. Furthermore, in March and April, the sardine season is over, and they are tied up. It would be easy, we thought, to charter such a boat. There must have been nearly a hundred of them anchored in back of the breakwater. We went to the pier and spread the word that we were looking for such a boat for charter. The word spread all right, but we were not overwhelmed with offers. In fact, no boat was offered. Only gradually did we discover the state of mind of the boat owners. They were uneasy about our project. Italians, Slavs, and some Japanese. They were primarily sardine fishers. They didn't even approve of fishermen who fish for other kinds of fish. 
they frankly didn't believe in the activities of the land, road building and manufacturing and bricklaying. This was not a matter of ignorance on their part, but of intensity. All the directionalism of thought and emotion that man was capable of went into sardine fishing. There wasn't room for anything else. An example of this occurred later when we were at sea. Hitler was invading Denmark and moving up towards Norway. There was no telling when the invasion of England might begin. Our radio was full of static and the world was going to hell. Finally, in all the crackle and noise of the short wave, one of our men made contact with an old, another boat. The conversation went like this. This is the Western Flyer. Is that you, Johnny? Yeah, that you, Sparky? Yeah, this is Sparky. How much fish you got? Only 15 tons. We lost a school today. How much fish you got? We're not fishing. Why not? Oh, we're going down in the Gulf to collect starfish and bugs and stuff like that. Oh, yeah? Well, okay, Sparky. I'll clear the wavelength. Wait, Johnny, you say you only got 15 tons? That's right. If you talk to my cousin, tell him, will you? Yeah, I will, Johnny. Western Flyer's all clear now. Hitler marched into Denmark and into Norway. France had fallen. The Maginot Line was lost. We didn't know it, but we knew the daily catch of every boat within 400 miles. It was simply a directional thing. A man only has so much. And so it was with the chartering of a boat. The owners were not distrustful of us. They didn't even listen to us because they couldn't quite believe we existed. We were obviously ridiculous. Now the time was growing short and we began to worry. Finally, one boat owner who was in financial difficulty offered his boat at a reasonable price, and we were ready to accept when suddenly he raised the price out of question and bolted. He was horrified at what he had done. He raised the price, not to cheat us, but to get out of going. The boat problem was growing serious when Anthony Berry sailed into Monterey Bay on the Western Flyer. The idea was no shock to Tony Berry. He had chartered to the government for salmon tagging in Alaskan waters, and was used to nonsense. Besides, he was an intelligent and tolerant man. He knew that he had idiosyncrasies and that some of his friends had. He was willing to let us do any crazy thing that we wanted, so long as we, number one, paid a fair price, number two, told him where to go, number three, did not insist that he endanger the boat, number four, got back on time, and number five, didn't mix him up in our nonsense. His boat was not busy, and he was willing to go. He was a quiet young man, very serious and a good master. He knew some navigation, a rare thing in the fishing fleet, and he had a natural caution which we admired. His boat was new and comfortable and clean, the engine in fine condition. We took the Western Flyer on charter. She was 76 feet long with a 25-foot beam. Her engine, 165 horsepower, direct reversible diesel, drove her at 10 knots. Her deckhouse had a wheel forward, then combination master's room and radio room, then bunk room, very comfortable, and behind that the galley. After the galley, a large hatch gave into the fish hold, and after the hatch were the big turntable and roller of the purse saner. She carried a 20-foot skiff and a 10-foot skiff. Her engine was a thing of joy, spotlessly clean, the moving surfaces shining and damp with oil and the green paint fresh and new on the housings. The engine room floor was clean, and all the tools polished and hung in their places. One look into the engine room inspired confidence in the master. We had seen other engines in the fishing fleet, and this perfection on the Western Flyer was by no means a general thing. As crew, we signed Tex Travis, engineer, and Sparky Inea, and Tiny Coletto, seamen. All three were a little reluctant to go, for the whole thing was crazy. None of us had been into the Gulf although the master had been as far as Cape San Lucas, and the Gulf had a really bad name. It was a thoughtful crew who agreed to go with us. We could never tell when the change of attitude toward us came, but it came very rapidly. Perhaps it was because Tony Berry was known as a cautious man who would not indulge in nonsense. Or perhaps it was pure relief that at last it had been settled. All of a sudden, we were overwhelmed with help. We had offers from men to go with us without pay. Sparky was offered a certain price for his job that was more than he would get from us. All he had to do was turn over his job and sit in Monterey and spend the money. But Sparky refused. Our project had become honorable. We had more help than we could use and advice enough to move the navies of the world. 
We did not know what our crew thought of the expedition, but later, in the field, they became good collectors. A little emotional sometimes, as when Tiny, in outrage at being pinched, declared a war of extermination on the whole Sally Lightfoot species. But on the whole, collectors of taste and quickness. The charter was signed with dignity and reverence. It is impossible to be light-hearted in the face of a ship's charter. For the law has foreseen or remembered the most doleful and arbitrary acts of God, and has set them down as possibilities, but in the tone of inevitabilities. Thus you read what you or the others must do in the case of a wreck, or sunken rocks, of death at sea, in its most painful and astonishing aspects, of injury to plank and keel, of water shortage and mutiny. Next to marriage settlement, or sentence of death, a ship's charter is as portentous a document as has ever been written. Penalties are set down against both parties, and if on some morning the rising sun should find your ship in the middle of the Mojave Desert, you have only to look again at the charter to find the blame assigned and the penalty indicated. It took us several hours to get over the solemn feeling the charter put on us. We thought we might live better lives and pay our debts, and one at least of us contemplated for one wholly horrified moment a vow of chastity. But the charter was signed, and food began to move into the western flyer. It is amazing how much food seven people need to exist for six weeks. Cases of spaghetti, cases and cases of peaches and pineapple, of tomatoes, whole Romano cheeses, canned milk in coveys, flour and cornmeal, gallons of olive oil, tomato paste crackers, cans of butter and jam, ketchup and rice, beans and bacon and canned meats, vegetables and soups and cans, truckloads of food. And all this food was stored eagerly and happily by the crew. It disappeared into cupboards, under little hatches in the galley floor, and many cases went below. We had done a good deal of collecting, but largely in temperate zones. The equipment for collecting, preserving, and storing specimens was selected on the basis of experience in other waters and of anticipation of difficulties imposed by a hot, humid country. In some cases we were right, in others very wrong. In a small boat, the library should be compact and available. We had constructed a strong, steel-reinforced wooden case, the front of which hinged down to form a desk. This case holds about 20 large volumes and has two filing cases, one for separates, scientific reprints, and one for letters. A small metal box holds pens, pencils, erasers, clips, steel tape, scissors, labels, pins, rubber bands, and so forth. Another compartment contains a 3 by 5 inch card file. There are cubby holes for envelopes, large separates, small separates, typewriter paper, carbon, a box for India ink and glue. The construction of the front makes room for a portable typewriter, drawing board, and T-square. There is a long narrow space for rolled charts and maps. Closed, this compact and complete box is 44 inches long by 18 by 18. Loaded, it weighs between 3 and 400 pounds. It was designed to rest on a low table or in an unused bunk. Its main value is compactness, completeness, and accessibility. We took it aboard the Western Flyer. There was no table for it to rest on. It did not fit in a bunk. It could not be put on the deck because of moisture. It ended up lashed to the rail on top of the deckhouse, covered with several layers of tarpaulin and roped on. Because of the roll of the boat, it had to be tied down at all times. It took about 10 minutes to remove the tarpaulin, untie the lashing line, open the cover, squeeze down between two crates of oranges, read the title of the wanted book upside down, remove it, close and lash and cover the box again. But if there had been a low table or a large bunk, it would have been perfect. For many little errors like this, we've concluded that all collecting trips to fairly unknown regions should be made twice. Once to make mistakes and once to correct them. Some of the greatest difficulty lies in the fact that previous collectors have never set down the equipment taken and its success or failure. We propose to rectify this in our account. The library contained all the separates then available on the... Panamic and Gulf Fauna. Primary volumes such as Johnson and Snook, Ricketts and Calvin, Russell and Young, Flatley and Walton, Keeps West Coast Shells, Fisher's three volume Starfish monograph, the Rathbun Breck Urine monograph, Schmidt's Marine Decapod Crustacea of California, 
Fraser's Hydroids, Barnhart's Marine Fishes of Southern California, Coast Pilots for the whole Pacific Ocean, charts both large and small scale of the whole region to be covered. The camera equipment was more than adequate, for it was never used. It included a fine German reflex and an 8mm movie camera with tripod, light meters, and everything. But we had no cameraman. During low tides, we all collected. There was no time to dry hands and photograph at the collecting scene. Later, the anesthetizing, killing, preserving, and labeling of specimens were so important that we still took no pictures. It was an error in personnel. There should be a cameraman who does nothing but take pictures. Our collecting material, at least, was good. Shovels wrecking in abalone bars, nets, long-handled dip nets, wooden fish kits, and a number of seven-cell flashlights for night collecting were taken. Containers seemed to go endlessly into the hold of the Western Flyer. Wooden fish kits with heads, 20 hard fur barrels with galvanized hoops in 15 and 30 gallon sizes, cases of gallon jars, quart, pint, 8 ounce, 5 ounce, and 2 ounce screw cap jars, several gross of cork vials in four sizes, 100 by 33 millimeter, 6 dram, 4 dram, and 2 dram sizes. There were eight 2.5 gallon jars with screw caps. And with all these, we ran short of containers, and before we were through, had to crowd those we had. This was unfortunate, since many delicate animals should be preserved separately to prevent injury. Of chemicals, we put into the boat a 15-gallon barrel of USP formaldehyde and a 15-gallon barrel of denatured alcohol. This was not nearly enough alcohol. The stock had to be replenished at Gaimus, where we bought 10 gallons of pure sugar alcohol. We took two gallons of Epsom salts for anesthetization and again ran out and had to buy more in Guyamas. Menthol, chromic acid, and Novocaine, all for relaxing animals, were included in the chemical kit. Of preparing equipment, there were glass chitin plates and string, lots of rubber gloves, graduates, forceps, and scalpels. Our binocular microscope, Bausch & Lomb AKW, was fitted with a 12-volt light, but on the rolling boat, the light was so difficult to handle that we used a spot flashlight instead. We had galvanized iron nested trays of 15 to 20 gallon capacity for gross hardening and preservation. We had enameled and glass trays for the laying out of specimens and one small examination aquarium. The medical kit had been given a good deal of thought. There was Nembatol, Butycine picrate for sunburn, 1,000 two-grain quinine capsules, 2% mercuric oxide salve for barnacle cuts, cathartix, ammonia, mercurochrome, iodine, alkaloid, and at last some whiskey for medicinal purposes. This did not survive our leave-taking, but since no one was ill on the whole trip, it may have done its job very well.